Hello and welcome. It's seven o'clock. There are uh, a few of you online. Um, welcome to the Caritas Consciousness Project. I'm Gloria Quidu, and we are broadcasting uh, from Colorado and Tucson, Arizona, where Dr. Claude Swanson lives. Um, in this series of lectures uh, on Claude Swanson's new book, um, The Science of the Soul, the Afterlife, and the Shift. And we are thrilled uh, to have attendees from all around the country. We're starting to get more and more out-of-state attendees, and today we got our first um, registrant from Brazil. So, bem-vindo, Rafael. I hope that continues. Uh, a few words about Dr. Claude Swanson. For those of you who are watching this for the first time, this is actually part four in his series, uh, and this particular lecture is on um, OBEs or out of body experiences and orbs. Um, Dr. Swanson was educated as a physicist at MIT and Princeton University for more than 25 years, interspersed with his conventional professional career in applied physics. Dr. Swanson has pursued investigations into unconventional physics. Um, his principal interest has been unified field theory, the so-called theory of everything, which could explain uh, the universe at the deepest possible levels. This has led him to investigate many aspects of the paranormal, which appear to be completely real phenomena that violate our present science. Paranormal phenomena, which have now been proven in the laboratory in many cases, offers a window into the deeper universe, the mysteries of consciousness, and unlock new forces and principles, which conventional science has only begun to glimpse. Um, Dr. Swanson likes to address questions at the end of his presentation. However, if you want to ask a question, all you have to do is type your question at any time by clicking the little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And then at the end of the lecture, um, we'll, he will answer them. I just wanted to make one little announcement. Um, we're having a thunderstorm here in Colorado, and a little while ago, the lights were flickering on and off. So just in case we lose power, um, it should switch over to Claude's um, computer, so it sh there should be no interruption, but if something goes wrong and that doesn't happen, um, then we will reconvene tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock, so Thursday evening, but hopefully all will go smoothly. Um, so now let me give you Claude Swanson. Okay. Claude. <clears throat> great. Well, thank you very much, Gloria. It's great to, great to be here. And we'll, you know, it, here in Tucson, we have what are, are we have very, we, we have what's, what's called the monsoon yes. season. Mm -hmm. So uh, very little rain comes, it comes all at once. So uh, we're hoping that we don't have a simultaneous problem if we move it till tomorrow and then have a monsoon. That would not be a good solution. Uh, but anyway, we'll just continue on here. Uh, this is uh, today, tonight's lecture is about OBEs and orbs. This is all based on my book, Science of the Soul, the Afterlife, and the Shift. Uh, this is from chapter three of the book. Um, so there really are 13 chapters in the book. And um, the first lecture was the introduction. So if you if you have not read the book, um, you know, it might be good at some point to take a look at it or go to the website and take a look, try to catch up on some of these uh, items. But as you well know, um, out-of-body experiences are one of the primary ways that we 
experience the paranormal. Uh, people, even when they're not uh, dead or dying, uh, can become expert at having out-of-body experiences. Uh, the Monroe Institute and other uh, places is, uh, teach how to do this. This is one of the standard uh, techniques in shamanic training. Uh, and it kind of gives us an, in, a window into another dimension, another reality. When you're out of body, suddenly you're not limited by the physical body anymore. Uh, it often happens when people have near-death experiences that um, as they lose consciousness, they may find themselves out of their body and looking back at it from floating around in the room or something else, watching the doctors. They can hear everything that's going on. They can move quickly and easily over large distances. And so many near-death experiences uh, begin with an out-of-body experience. Uh, so um, it's a very, very important phenomenon and gives us a, a useful window. It tells us there's something else beyond just the physical, and the physical body is not the limitation or the be-all and end-all that we may think it is from growing up in our culture. So this is my background that uh, Gloria went over. I have a conventional uh, physics education, MIT and Princeton. Uh, and it was really when I learned about remote viewing, uh, I was doing some government research in the 1980s, and I heard about it, um, not something I was actually working on, but other people who I knew had been doing it, and I heard about what went on. And that's always been the issue with paranormal and psychic phenomena in general, that our culture tells us that it's not uh, repeatable enough to be able to make a science out of it. But I was finding that remote viewers actually could go out of body and get very accurate information about things that were far away, um, and even uh, in travel in time as well as in space. So it's a very, very important little wake-up call to tell us that the physical world is only a tiny slice of the reality of the real universe. And all these other phenomena uh, of consciousness, near-death experiences, higher dimensions, the af afterlife, those are all things that are also very real, but they're different. They follow different, different laws and different sets of rules. Um, the out-of-body experience can be very powerful in teaching us this deep lesson. Bob Monroe, who became an expert on having out-of-body experiences because he developed a, technolo a technology, a sound, he put sounds in each of his two ears, and the sounds were slightly different in frequency, and the, the beat frequency would affect his brain and help him go out-of-body. He learned how to do this and started his organization, the Monroe Institute, back in the, uh, in the 60s. He says a controlled out-of-body experience is the most efficient means we know to create a different overview. First, and perhaps most important among these knowns is survival of physical death. Okay, once, once you're out of body, then you see that the body is not essential for consciousness. So uh, uh, Charles Tart, one of the great uh, researchers in this field, says thousands if not millions of people alive today have had the experience of existing outside the space of their physical bodies for a brief period and experiencing the separated state as real, not as a dream or imaginary experience. A typical consequence is that they say now, I no longer believe that I have a soul or that some part of me will survive. I know it. It's actually been in many, many cultures around the world, uh, out-of-body experiences are totally normal and part of the belief system. Uh, Janet Mitchell says in 1978, a cross-cultural study by Shields revealed that only three of 44 societies did not hold a belief in OBEs. So it's really our Western culture that's singular and different in this way that we 
tend not to believe in these things. Most people know that they're real. Um, and uh, Jeffrey Hodgson, who began doing research uh, years ago on the, the, the spirit realm, and he developed a, an ability to see things, to see subtle energies and see uh, subtle spirits. He says, the natural body used by elemental lives seems to be a pulsing globe of light. And the reason I mention that is because when people go out of body, they're often perceived as a globe of light. This little globe of light, which may be a fraction of an inch in diameter up to as big as a few inches, seems to be what our soul looks like, what the essence of our consciousness looks like in that state. Uh, Joe Holbert, a man I knew in Virginia who's a ghost hunter and had all, all kinds of really good technology for looking for ghosts, he said he tried to photograph them hundreds of times and all he ever got were these little balls of light. So the, the little orbs are more persistent. They're more in our, they're actually in our physical dimension to some extent. There's more crossover. So the orbs are an important part of the OBE. And it's something that can be measured and photographed and observed so we can kind of get a handle on it with our Western way of thinking. But the Egyptians, of course, knew thousands of years ago that the outer body uh, experience and the soul is an important part of who we are, that it travels, how we, we travel out of body. Um, it's been known for a very long time. Uh, Plutarch in the Roman Empire described an OBE that occurred uh, in AD 79. Um, what he, he said, approaching the borderland of death, I stepped over the threshold and was conducted through the elements. Although it was midnight, the light was brilliant. I stepped into the presence of gods. Uh, Plato talks about the out-of-body experience. Many ancient writers do. Uh, in uh, Indonesia, uh, the, sh the shamans, who are the, the wise men of their culture, uh, use the out-of-body experience for gaining knowledge, for giving guidance to their leaders, for traveling, for finding game. Uh, here's an interview between uh, John Perkins and an Indonesian shaman. Uh, he says, uh, Buley's, Buley was another shaman he was talking to. The description reminded me of the Shuara shaman, whose soul wandered off to join the jaguar. This is when, this is when they're hunting. These tribes often use the out-of-body experience when they want to find the game. They go out of body. They can fly around, look around from, from overhead, find where the game is, and they can actually look into the future and know where the game will be. And then they come back into body, and they have to travel then to that spot and they know the game will be there when they get there. So Perkins is asking uh, this Indonesian shaman, he says, is that the way your captains navigate? Because these were great sailors, and great seamen. And he said, and they said, uh, it is the old way. It is the right way, known as the two selves approach. This is how they navigated. We wonder how the Polynesian, how the Polynesians crossed the Pacific. And there are all kinds of theories about it. But this is how they did it. They go out of body. He said it's called the two selves approach. Perkins says, do you, act, do you actually fly? And the man says, fly? But of course we do. That is to say, the spirit self does. How else could our captains use this method to find their way across vast oceans? How could shipmakers like me find the perfect tree amidst all the trees of the forest? The two selves approach brings bliss to the person using it and is, as the Europeans say, efficient. So you can see that many, many cultures have used this ability uh, in a primary way for a long, long time. Um, the initiation is another uh, process that's often used to teach the out-of-body experience or to stimulate an out-of-body experience in young people to help them to be able to achieve it more easily. Um, there's a wonderful movie called A Man Called Horse about a Lakota 
Indian who goes through um, an initiation. And uh, it's the Sundance, I guess, where he's, he's actually, they, they take ropes and they stick them through the pectoral muscles of the, of the man and string him up and then suspend him for hours or days until he goes out of body. And um, then they have vision quests. They go out of body and they fly around and they come back and they can give information to the shaman to ensure that they, in fact, were able to get there. This is one way of inducing um, out-of-body experiences. I, I frankly prefer Monroe Institute and Hemisync. I'm not sure I want the Lakota method, but it might be more effective. I don't know. Um, Dr. Audrey, Aubrey, Audrey Butt wrote of the Amazonians. They said also the human spirit, in some cases, has the ability to detach itself from the body. Uh, the shaman is the master of this technique. But also others who are not shamans can project their spirits. So this is a you know, well-known technique. Sylvan Muldoon was an expert at this. And he says psychic research has too long established the belief within every material being that there is a non-material double. This is one of the mysteries that I'm interested in trying to track down and figure out. Uh, because when you read the material about out-of-body experiences, uh, this double appears quite often. It's clear that oftentimes when we go out of body, uh, this this form that looks that can, can look like us, it's a copy of our physical body, but we can project it somewhere else. And so sometimes when people go out of body, they are perceived. As that, as that physical form, even though their physical form may be lying in a couch somewhere, in a, in a bedroom someplace, 100 miles away, but that physical form, that uh, hologram seems to go with the, with the um, the soul, with the astral body, and um, that's the double. Uh, every night when we go to sleep, uh, we are we are said to go out of body for some of the time. Uh, what uh, clairvoyants claim is that um, there are certain energies, and these are probably torsion energies, that the astral form, this is one of like one of the layers of our, of our aura, can absorb this energy. And so it floats above the physical body. It's connected by the silver cord, which transmits energy back to the physical body. But they picture that double, that astral body, floating out of the bed. And uh, sometimes when you're having dreams, you may actually be traveling. You may be, uh, that, that body may be going somewhere and doing something. If you think you're flying and have flying dreams or very vivid dreams of visiting certain places, that astral body may well be there. And your physical body is lying back at home in bed. But the other part is out there doing, a, doing an OBE. And you may not remember it, but it's often doing it. I know plenty of people who, who do what they call night work. They, they work at night uh, by helping the world. And they lie in bed, but their astral body goes flying around the earth and trying to repair things or heal things as they perceive is needed. Uh, we have lots of data to show that these uh, effects and out-of-body experiences are real, and they have these characteristics. Um, one really great evidential case for the skeptics um, happened to a lady who was in a hospital. She was suddenly in critical condition, and during the operation, she found herself outside of the hospital. Uh, she was hovering about three stories above the ground, looking at the out, outer wall of the uh, hospital, and there she saw a blue tennis shoe that was lying on a windowsill. It was a man's dark blue tennis shoe, worn and scuffed on the left-hand side. When she was revived after the operation, she was shaken because how is this possible that she did this? And she told uh, the nurse, Kimberly 
Clark Sharp about it. And Sharp went to the window and looked at exactly where Maria said it was and was able to find it. it, was, it you couldn't see it from outside the building, but you had to look exactly in the right place. And it was a total confirmation of, uh, of her experience. So it's things like this, lots of experiments uh, have done the same type of thing in a more organized, repeatable way to show that when we perceive things in the OBE state, it may have very close correspondence to reality. There are lots of cases like this, and I have several in my book. Uh, one of them is the, the Wilmot case, where this man uh, was taking an ocean voyage uh, back in the 1930s, and um, there was a terrible storm one night, and he had a dream in which he saw his wife come into the room, come into his stateroom on the ship. And she looked around and saw that he was not the only person in the stateroom. There was another man on another bunk there. But she came over to him and kissed him. When he woke up the next day, his uh, passenger, his fellow passenger, his bunkmate, said, you're, you're a pretty fellow to have a lady come and visit you in the middle of the night. So to his bunkmate, the lady was perfectly real. But in fact, this was his wife who was thousands of miles away back home. But his wife was also aware of the experience. She remembered going into the room on ship looking at him saw the other man there and felt uncomfortable but then still went ahead and, and bent down and kissed him so we have three different people all of whom verified the same experience and mr landau um, had a wife who frequently went, went out of body and uh, at night while sleeping had all kinds of experiences he wanted to, he was a sci scientific sort of person so one night he said well pick up my uh, address book beside your bed there and bring it across the hall because she was across the hall from him bring it across the hall and leave it by my bed so i'll know that you did it and um, when she woke up and when she came out of body her physical body was still sleeping she tried to pick up his address book but her hand went through it and she couldn't pick it up and um, she looked around her room and found a toy stuffed dog and picked that up she was able to carry that and brought it across the hall and dropped it by his bedside and then as she was backing out of the room kind of kind of gliding is how he described it, not exactly walking he woke up and noticed her doing this and they had a conversation um, and she said well she tried to pick up the the manual the the, the address book but her mother had always told her don't pick up things that don't belong to you. And so her hand went through it. But uh, anyway, it's, a, it's one of those remarkable things where when we're out of body, we have this other form, which here I'm depicting as the way Mr. Landau saw it, as a sort of holographic replication of his wife. Now her body is still back in bed asleep, but he sees this ghostly form that looks just like her that's floating back out of the room. It's able to manipulate physical things like picking up a dog. Um, and some people can see it quite clearly. So this is the interesting thing about this double, this an aspect of the, uh, the out of the astral body. So if, when one can learn to have an out-of-body experience, they occur more spontaneously than most people realize. Uh, there's one example of a daughter living in a different state who just had a baby. Her mother wanted to go visit, but had not gone yet. In fact, she bought a pretty red dress to wear when she did go visit. But one night she was cooking supper, waiting for her husband to come home, and she lay down in bed just to rest, had her apron on, and as she dropped into a semi-conscious state, 
she suddenly found herself standing in her daughter's home in Oregon, hundreds of miles away. Um, she could tell that her daughter's husband was home and holding the baby at the moment that she appeared there. They both looked up at her, were startled, and they called her. They, they, were, they were scared because here was their mother suddenly appearing in their home without any warning, and they were afraid maybe she just died. And so they called her and found her back in her home in California. But um, the funny thing was, not only had she gone out of body, but she hadn't appeared in the apron that she was wearing in California. She was wearing the pretty red dress that she bought especially for the trip. So, so it shows how our consciousness plays an important role in out-of-body experiences, and how we manifest them, and how we are perceived uh, when we do. There's another one here of a, um, a soldier. I mean, warfare is a great, that's a terrible thing, but if people do have lots of, of paranormal experiences and near-death experiences of all the injuries and trauma that go on on the battlefield, in one case, a man was in a car hit by a shell, and there was an explosion, and he could see, he was out of body, and he could see the physical body as well as the astral body, and um, he was aware they were both, they were both present there. So uh, although OBEs are one of the first stages of the NDE, near-death experience, we can also have an OBE without being dead. And that makes a great tool for research because you can learn to have an OBE. The Monroe Institute and other places like that teach us, in theory at least, how to relax and go out of body. And um, some people who've been very good at it have worked with scientists and allow themselves to be tested to learn more about what that really means when they go out of body. And they show that consciousness can exist without the body and that our present science can't explain this. So it really has a long way to go. We're missing a lot of really important things here in understanding this stuff. But when we die, out of body experiences are normally reported as part of the near-death experience. But I've talked to uh, nurses who work in hospice and nurses who work in hospitals who say that when a person dies, they often see a, go a, a globe, a golden globe, or something, a, a cloud, cloudy mist leaving that person's body. Here's a photograph of one person at the moment of death where uh, a globe of energy was seen leaving his body, but it's just one more confirmation that this energy form is something real and it's part of who we are. Uh, as you probably may remember from the last lecture, I also talked about the experiments um, of McDougall who weighed the physical body of the person at the time of death. And he also found that when we die, there's a weight loss. We lose about 21 grams and that is believed to be this energy that's leaving the body. Um, this whole issue, what we see when you see an astral body during a projection is complicated because consciousness is wrapped up with it. Uh, here is one expert at going out of body named Alex Tenhouse. He did a lot of experiments uh, with scientists over many years. In one case, he says, I was chosen to participate in what they call a, a fly-in experiment. They wanted him to fly into the lab where they were doing the experiment, to fly in out of body. He would, he would leave his body and project himself to Dr. Carlos Osa's office. What they hadn't told him was there was going to be a psychic, Christine Whiting, 
who was there to see if she could see anything when he arrived. And she not only described where he was when he arrived, but they just, she described him in physical detail. Um, he was wearing a shirt with roll up sleeves, corduroy pants, and it corresponded perfectly to how he was dressed. So some people, based upon their level of consciousness, were able to see these astral bodies quite clearly. Um, a lot of us, probably I'm one of them, <laughs> um, you know, if we're not in that, if we're more left brain or more, or we're not able to relax enough or to allow these energies to get our attention, then most of us tend to miss a lot of this stuff. So the level of consciousness, the, the state of consciousness has something to do with how we perceive the outer body state. But the other mysterious, fascinating thing about it is that when you are out of body, that out of body form can sometimes exert physical force and manipulate objects. It's like in the movie Ghost with Patrick Swayze, um, where he's trying to learn how to move a penny around and he's, his finger goes right through it. He can't, can't make it move. And um, he's dead, of course, and he's in the ghostly form. And uh, He's trying to learn how to do it. And eventually he does develop the skill. He learns that getting angry or getting strong emotion seems to be helpful in making it move. Uh, William Buhlman, who's an expert in going out of body and teaches courses at Monroe Institute, um, says that when he goes out of body, he will consciously lower his vibration if he wants to affect a physical object. So let's say he's lying down, he goes out of body, he floats around as a pencil, he's put in a certain place near a table. And he wants to roll the pencil, try to make, make it move, maybe even fall off the table. He'll go over and try to push it. And if he pushes it, normally his fingers or hand might go right through it. But if he practices lowering his vibration, he can often then come into resonance with the object and any sort of force on it. And that kind of suggests that the out-of-body form is a higher frequency than physical matter. And so from the, from the sort of synchronized universe idea that we talked about before, that's the basis of, of, of this book and all my other books, that, that we live in a synchronized universe, the physical world is a synchronized universe, where we perceive things that we're synchronized with that the spiritual realms have a different frequency. And if when we, when we die or move into those realms, we'll synchronize at a different frequency and then they'll become real. Um, and so it's, it's really consistent with that idea. So if you are in a higher spiritual plane and you know, the out-of-body form, then you want to lower your vibration, lower your frequency to get closer to the physical, to interact with the physical. And that's what Buhlman found works. So it's a little, it's a, a follow-on to Patrick Swayze's practice in the movie Ghost. Here's one more example of that. Another person um, <clears throat> who um, observed the ability of out-of-body forms to exert a force. In this case, a ship had been uh, had left Liverpool, England been at sea for several weeks. Uh, the first mate, Robert Bruce, was surprised to find a strange man writing on a blackboard in the captain's cabin on the ship. Now, there wasn't any, supposed to be anybody writing there. Nobody was supposed to be there except the captain. But the man was writing, and what he wrote on the blackboard was, steer to the northwest. And then they couldn't find the man after that. He disappeared and he couldn't find any, he was not, wasn't on shipboard. Looked at all, all the passengers, he, he wasn't among them. Well, the captain figured maybe he should follow this advice, not knowing what it meant. So he steered toward the Northwest. After several hours, he, they saw another vessel that was stuck in the ice. All the passengers 
on that vessel were taken on board their ship. Among them, Bruce recognized the man he had seen writing on the blackboard. The captain then asked him to write down the words, steer to the northwest. His handwriting matched that on the blackboard perfectly. And as they interviewed the man further, they found that he'd been, they, you know, because they were stranded in the ice on that ship, the man had been uh, sleeping in a, in a comfortable chair, taking a nap when this whole event happened. And uh, clearly he was, uh, his out of body form was busy though, sending a message to the other ship and uh, it led to their rescue. But just the ability to, first of all, to appear like a physical flesh and blood person. And secondly, to be able to pick up chalk and write with it while his physical body is back on the ship is pretty amazing. It tells us that the outer body form has these basic capabilities to manipulate matter when it's done by the right kind of people who you know how to do it. So these examples show that sometimes OBEs can exert a physical force and move objects. And Buhlman, I mentioned as an example. What one name for this double is, that goes with the astral body is called the etheric duplicate. It's often described as being exactly like the physical body. It's a kind of a template or a copy of the physical body. One of my proposals, one of my theories, and I can't say I'm positive about this, but um, this idea of a template or a, a hologram, perfect copy of our physical body, we also encounter that in the afterlife. Uh, when you get into the astral realm, for example, uh, could look around and, and recognize other people who are there. They look like you remember them. They may look like they looked when you last knew them, or they may look somewhat younger, but they have a copy of their physical body, their physical appearance that they take with them. So it appears as though the soul must have a, a template that is part of its structure that it carries with it wherever it goes and therefore we can project this template when we need to, when we, or when we want to. So that, that's my guess, is that that template might be the same template that we see in the afterlife, and that we see in these etheric body and, and double uh, examples. So if you want to try to make a little picture of how this might fit together, you'd say, well, on the left-hand side here is a physical body, the person has an out-of-body experience, they go, they go out of body, and their soul body, which is a collection of, I'm proposing, torsion, the special kind of energy that can travel very fast uh, over great distances, but it can carry a lot of information in it, and it's not physical. So it can travel somewhere, so you go out of body, and that, that's the primary thing that travels but it has the, the information in it to be able to project a holographic copy of itself, of the image, wherever it goes. So for example, the lady who um, suddenly showed up in Oregon visiting her daughter when her physical body was taking a nap back in California, you can explain by a picture like this, that her physical body is lying taking a nap, but her, her soul body her, the energy of her orbs and her astral body travels to her daughter and projects the double into the room where it's perceived as being her. So this kind of model might work to explain a lot of these examples. So researchers have tried to uh, track down and verify the realities of the outer body form of the astral body, as we call it. <clears throat> and because it's sort of the closest 
sting to the physical in terms of vibrational frequency, um, we have the best hope of being able to get data on it and show physical effects from it. Um, one type of experiment that's been done uh, was done by the uh, Chinese in the 1970s. Uh, they had very good remote viewers and they would uh, take a uh, envelope, brown envelope, put um, a sheet of x-ray film in it and then a picture of a Chinese character, which is there are 50,000 characters. So you're not gonna guess by random chance which one it is, but they put the character in there with it, so you know, the envelope and then ask their remote viewers to go out of body and take a look at the envelope and tell them which character it was. And they found that when they got the character right, which they did pretty often, remarkably, an image of the character would be produced on the film. It was as though somehow the film had been exposed by a bright light to produce its image. And of course, there was no light and, and the envelope had been closed, which means that the astral body or the energetic body or the soul body, the out-of-body form that went to take a look at that character must have carried its own energy with it that caused the film to become exposed. And therefore the character got its picture taken in the process. Um, so they did this a lot of times, many, many cases, and we're getting good results. Um, Hal Putoff was one person who was invited to look in on some of those experiments. And he was so impressed when he came back to the US, he wanted to duplicate them as best he could. So um, he'd been involved with remote viewing, so he knew some good remote viewers. But um, instead of Chinese characters, he used the photomultiplier tube. A photomultiplier tube is very sensitive to light. And then he put a, um, a picture or a scene or something, a target of some kind uh, at the face of the photomultiplier tube that would attract the remote viewer. He would tell the remote viewer, go look at that picture and tell me what you see, what you see, describe it to me. And when they had the correct description, we found that flashes of light were showing up in the photomultiplier tube. They were getting signals. And of course, the whole thing was closed off from the outside world. So there was no outside light getting in. So this again is the astral body providing energy or something, causing change that allows the photomultiplier tube to respond. What we, what I suspect now for the real explanation is that a photomultiplier tube has little plates in it, in little metal plates inside, and they're under high voltage. And so they want to emit a spark. They want to emit electrons uh, if they receive any light. That's how they work. But if you hit it with some torsion, some left-handed torsion, according to my second book, that'll also cause that photomultiplier tube to give off more current. So when they, so that if you, if an object that has that kind of torsion were to impact that tube, it would have the same effect that they saw. And I think that's probably the mechanism that they were getting detections, uh, probably not from conventional light, but from torsion. That's just my own interpretation of that data. But um, the bottom line is basically they were detecting the astral body. They were detecting it and uh, lots of other ways have also been devised of detecting that same energy source. One of them was Carlos Osis, who did some experiments in New York with uh, Alex Tanaus, the remote, remote viewer again. This uh, diagram shows the floor plan of his laboratory. At one end, there was a room, this label room B here, with a, um, a special box that was suspended by, by big rubber bands from the ceiling, isolated electrically and vibration and everything else. 
and it was going to change its image every so often. And when it did, it would make different pictures. Then the remote viewer was put at the opposite end of the complex on the right hand side of the image here. He would get lie on a, on a bed, go out of body, and um, describe what image was being created over in the shielded room. And they found that when he was accurate, when he could give a good description of what was going on over there, uh, they were getting. What? What's wrong? Hello? Yeah. yeah. What's wrong? I'm sorry. I'm getting feedback here. What's wrong? Sorry, Claude. That was my fault. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll keep on going then. Okay. Okay. So, so they found that when they did, what they got was the following, that around that little box with where the images were being created were some strange signals being produced. They had strain gauges, they had lights, they had magnetic measuring, all kinds of different things were showing that weird energies were showing up when he was getting correct answers, which meant that his out-of-body form was causing signals that um, they could pick up. So that um, it tells us that this is the soul body that we have that carries this information, this knowledge, this the center of our perception, has some energies with it that they, they, they probably don't correspond to the familiar types of energy that we know about in our physics, like, like electricity and magnetism, but they do affect those things. So we have the ability to measure when this special energy is present because it'll cause change in those detectors. So we have lots of experiments like this that show that the outer body uh, case, the astral body is real and can be picked up. Here's another way of doing it, uh, curly and photography which is a whole subject unto itself. It's a chapter in my second book. Uh, here's a lady, very good at going out of body. She's standing on a platform that is vibrating with high voltage. It's basically a Curlian photographic device where her whole body is, is, is oscillating at this high frequency and um, her chakras are showing up in the image as a set of bright lines down the center of her body. And you can see the glow around her body, which is part of her aura. Then she goes out of body. And when she does, on the, the right-hand image, it creates this cloudy energy off to the side that is remarkable and her chakras are now displaced in that direction as well so it's it's one more way of looking you know before i mentioned that when we go out of body the voltages in our body in our physical body decrease because they go kind of with the astral body and this is kind of an example of that another kind of experiment that's been done is with uh cats cats are able to see this energy uh, much better than we can. Um, I had a friend who was very good at going out of body, who used to love to watch a certain TV show at night. Uh, his father always made him go to bed early, and he had to miss his show. But his father would watch it in the living room. Well, my friend would go into his bedroom, he was maybe 12 years old, lie down in his bed, go out of body, and his astral body would crawl across, float across the ceiling of the living room over his father and look down at the TV and he got to watch his show. His father never caught on, but he said the whole time he was floating across the room over to the TV, his cat was watching him as he moved across the room. His cat could track his motion completely. And uh, Keith Harari used the same ability of cats to do some experiments. He had a little kitten that he was very attached to. 
they would put them in, put them in a box out of the field, and the uh, box had s squares marked off on the bottom of the box so they could track its motion. They would also count the number of meows that it made because when it was unhappy, it was it was meow. Then Harari walked about a half mile away to a room, went out of body, and tried to come back and comfort the kitten in the out of body form. And when he did that, they found a dramatic change in the pacing of the cat and in the number of meows that it made. And these graphs show the data. The number of meows, the top graph, and uh, you can see that when Harari is not doing anything, the cat is making, it's in the left-hand column, the cat is making a lot of meows in 100 seconds. When Harari is present, the meows go down to almost zero. Likewise, the bottom graph shows the pace of how many squares the cat is crossing. And again, when he's not trying to comfort the kitten, it crosses a lot of squares, it's pacing around. But when he goes out there and tries to comfort the kitten, it calms down and it stops walking around. So all of these things are showing us that we have an out-of-body experience. And we think we are somewhere else. We're watching something or we are someplace. There's some part of us, some energetic part that actually is there. And these experiments are measuring that and showing that there is that part that's present there. When that happens, the electrical signals at the physical body become weaker because the energy has gone with the astral body to the other location. And these are some, some measurements um, showing um, a person in the non-out-of-body state, that's the upper uh, line, the black curve, and in the out-of-body state, that's the red curve down below, the comparison of their EEG, their electroencephalogram levels in those two states. There's a lot more energy in the non-out-of-body state. When they're out-of-body, the voltages are much lower. So here is um, what one clairvoyant says about the whole subject of the orbs are evidence of dimensional shifts in your reality. Often orbs are thoughts of beings that come to you from afar. Now I would say when she says they're thoughts of beings, I interpret that as it's the consciousness of a being that's actually present where you are. They're curious about your world. For them, it is like going to the zoo. They can drop into your world and see what you are doing. If you choose to, you too can become an orb. And many people do become orbs. And some of the people that I've described in these uh, examples are orbs during the experiments that they're part of. And they're, they look like orbs, they act like orbs, they are orbs. Um, you can send out your consciousness elsewhere to see what's occurring there. This form of movement is available to you at this time. It gives you the ability to commune with nature. And uh, here is one photograph, which you've probably seen before if you've heard me talk before, but it's uh, a bunch of us uh, went, went orb hunting in a haunted area, in a state park, <clears throat> where, um, you know, and most of my friends are UFO experiencers or they have high strangeness backgrounds. So strange things tend to happen around them anyway. They're, they're more sensitive to these energies than the average person. Uh, but after several days of doing experiments, we still didn't have any really good data. And then a 12 year old girl uh, in our group was walking back to the cabin in the afternoon and saw this three foot diameter orb hovering in front of the cabin. And she said, she said, I thought it wanted me to take its picture. And she happened to have a camera around her neck. So she picked up the camera, snapped the picture, and then promptly forgot about it. And the, cat, the orb 
and zipped away. Several days later, the photographs came back that her mother had developed from their little expedition, and this picture was among them. And then she remembered, oh, that was this case, and she remembered how it happened. But this was a dramatic use. It's hard to see from this picture, but the post, the post of the door of the front porch is actually visible through that bubble, through that, that big orb. It's also reflecting the light from the sky. Uh, there's an opening, a clearing of trees above it. It's sort of reflecting things that are around it. So it's, it's quite a remarkable picture. Uh, most orbs tend to be much smaller and they're seen much more easily. Um, if you have a night shot video camera that is sensitive to near infrared, it's uh, just a little bit longer wavelength than the visible. Uh, it's good for night vision. Um, orbs are oftentimes seen with these video cameras. I have a Sony night shot camera, for example. And um, I have a friend, uh, he was in Colorado then, Christopher Moon, who's a ghost hunter. He'd grown up in a particular house up in Colorado where there were lots of orbs. He said that um, there was a certain place in his bedroom where they used to appear. They would be like a crack or a noise that you would hear over the video camera when they would pop in. And almost all of a sudden, they would begin streaming out of this spot in space, almost like a dimensional rift between dimensions. They would come, like hundreds of them, come streaming out and then go off in different directions. And it seemed like maybe they were coming to visit the physical plane, you know, almost like they were on a little excursion. Um, and I've come across examples in my research, I have some of them in the book, uh, where people in the afterlife describe coming back and visiting the physical dimension. And they do it in kind of a similar way. They, they get permission, they get some uh, guidance first from uh, their, their guides and teachers on the other side as far as when they get to come back here. But then they, it's, it's, there's a system and it's almost like an excursion. So, um, and when they come back here, they do kind of look like bubbles to us or usually they're, they're pretty much invisible unless we use a technology like a night shot camera to make them visible. Um, but um, I have one really, really good example of one man who describes being inside a bubble, looking out at his family when he came back to check in on them. So anyway, um, in this particular house that Christopher Moon grew up in, uh, there were lots of little orbs flying around there, but I wasn't having much luck in, in seeing. They moved very quickly, and uh, he, he was very quick, very adept, being able to see them. So I said, well, Chris, could, could you get him to slow down a little bit so I can see them too? And so he talks, and the room was totally dark. It was night, totally black, no lights on. He just speaks into the darkness and asks if an, or if orbs, if an orb would slow down and, and appear for my video camera so that I can photograph it. Within about two seconds, this is a frame from my video camera, the top frame, frame one there, a little spot popped in. And um, the, the picture itself is grainy, so it's probably hard to tell. The circle is added for emphasis, but there's a bright dot there that just popped in that's the orb. And then it began slowly moving toward me and to the right in about eight frames. The lower frame is the eighth frame of the sequence. Just very slowly, leisurely moving, really making it very easy for anybody, even me, to see the orb in the video camera. And this just shows that they are intelligent, that they do respond to us, they're conscious beings, that they're, they're they're really just like us. A lot of them are. They may be more advanced, some of them, but they respond to communication. So, um, you know, the whole, the whole subject seems like a really great place 
for science to get a foothold in the afterlife because the orbs are close enough to our dimension that we can measure them, observe them, and prove that they're real, yet at the same time, they are part of the other side. They're part of spirits that have departed the physical plane. Um, that's Joe Holbert's quote again here. So this is the one case that I mentioned. Uh, Chico Xavier, uh, one of the later chapters in my book is about mediums. Uh, many of our experiences with the afterlife come from media, the people who can sense or speak to or communicate with the spirits. Uh, Chico Xavier was very gifted in this way. He could just relax and the spirit could take over his arm and write. And automatic writing it's called, but he could write very, very quickly. And he wrote 400 books this way in his lifetime. And he was not a very literate man, had no library, and yet his books show remarkable knowledge, uh, mastery of languages and cultures. Uh, and so they are themselves monuments to the fact that we continue to live after we depart the physical plane. In many cases, there were authors whose work on the physical plane was not finished. And they were coming back and, and, and speaking through him and writing more books, using him as the, uh, the channel to allow him to, to write them. Typically, when Chico Xavier was working, he would relax in his chair with his pen. He'd have another person who had the job of putting blank paper under his hand. He would write so fast that somebody had to keep putting more sheets of paper under there to... Uh, keep up with it. So the, the whole subject of, I have a, whole, a, lot of, a lot of information about Chico Xavier uh, in the book, but he was one of the, the, the great Brazilian spiritists that if you know about Gloria and about the Caritas Center, you probably know about Xavier. And his classic book, Nosso Mar, um, is, is one of the uh, primary sources about the afterlife. Um, Aunt Dr. Dr. Andre began communicating with Chico after he died and talking about his experience, describing his experience, what happened um, in lots of detail. In one of the cases, he describes a trip he made back into the physical dimension. He wanted to check on his family. He wanted to see what they were doing. And when he did that, he was inside a little bubble looking out and he could float around the house, the old house he used to live in, and watch them, things like that. They didn't see him, but it was a classic orb and he was describing it from the inside. We have other cases that are similar to that. Uh, Jenny Koppel, who uh, wrote a couple of books about her, her memories of her past lives, uh, quite a remarkable woman, uh, was regressed hypnotically and she found herself floating inside something like a soap bubble. While around her were other bubbles that she knew were people. She was bodiless. It didn't seem to matter at all. She was still aware of being herself, an individual soul. So this bubble was her identity. This is the astral body. This is her soul body. Every bubble glowed brightly with an energy that I took to be the basic life force that is ourselves. So again, she's describing what it's like being inside one of these bubbles, uh, looking out. And, and again, she said she, she was small. She was the size of a thumb, about the size of about a centimeter or so, but the, the size that orbs often show up. She also describes uh, Shanti Devi's uh, description of a similar experience. And Sylvia Brown, when she was a young girl, was uh, brushing her hair at the mirror, and she heard a high-pitched voice hovering beside her ear. It looked, and there was a little orb squeaking, talking to her in a high-pitched voice. 
And she freaked out and went running to her mother. She asked, what? What's this? What's going on? And her mother, who was also a psychic, said, oh, don't worry, dear. It's just your grandmother. She just came back to talk to you. Um, so you know, for some cultures, this is a well-known fact that our ancestors, the beings on the other side, can still communicate in this form. Native Americans um, have a close connection with their ancestors. In many ceremonies, they invoke their ancestors. They chant and they ask their ancestors to come and join them in healing ceremonies and things like that. I think it's called the Uweepi, where you're down in the uh, in the, uh, the lodge, in a big circle with all the tribe members of the village and uh, doing the chanting and the shaman is in the middle of the floor, he's tied up and uh, it's all dark in there. But as they begin drumming and chanting, they'll see little lights flying around their heads, flying in a big circle around the room. And they'll hear little squeaky voices coming from those lights. These are their ancestors. They know that this is part of their culture. And those ancestors come back and show up and assist in some of the healing work that goes on. So they're quite familiar with this idea that ancestors, those on the other side, can come back in an orb form. Hawaiian kahunas have the same knowledge. Uh, they talk about the various components of the soul. And one they talk about is the uhane, the soul that talks. It has a little voice. It speaks in a high-pitched voice squeaky voice. And now we know that electronic voice phenomena, which is one of the main ways we have of studying the afterlife, uh, you know, and this is another chapter in the book, but um, scientists began discovering, if you take a um, tape recorder out into a field or the, into a graveyard, or even maybe just in your bedroom, and just begin talking if you have some pretty good connection with spirits, begin talking, and you will find messages showing up, uh, coming into your tape recorder. This was originally discovered by a man named Jurgensen, who was using a tape recorder that was designed for bird calls. And I think that bird calls are a really good idea because they are better at high frequency. What we now know is that orbs, because they are small, and they are high frequency, they tend to make voices that are higher frequency than normal hearing. So if you have a really good, if you have a young person's, I mean, Sylvia Brown was seven or eight, she had a young person's perfect hearing, she could hear some of those little voices, but when she would be 30 or 40, she might not be able to hear them. But they could be talking to us and we wouldn't know. Um, so the electronic voice phenomena, uh, they discovered most of the signal was showing up at the 10 kilohertz to 20 kilohertz frequency band. But when they expanded their electronics to higher frequencies, up to 40 kilohertz, they got much better signals and they could do much better EVP. So um, what we're learning is that that whole phenomenon, this whole subject is really going back to orbs, based on orbs. And I have some diagrams in the book to show how orbs can not only create a sound, but they can create electronic signals. Uh, for example, Christopher Moon, when he was watching with his night shot camera in the room, he would see occasionally that an orb would fly into the recording head of the tape recorder, especially if he asked it to. And he realized that they, by vibrating, they can modulate the magnetic field of the recorder and therefore create a sound on the tape recorder. In the same way with a microphone, by vibrating, they can affect the electrical properties of the microphone and of space itself and create a signal. So it appears that orbs are probably the origin of EVP.
this just says what I just said, basically. Another important piece of this subject is uh, to be able to tell real orbs from fake orbs. Um, I get lots of pictures of orbs from people, but most of them are not, not aware that you can get fake orbs very, very easily. And uh, most people don't think much about it. But cameras are very subject to lens flare. So if you take your picture in some particular direction, it's a bright object off of, the, off of your image, it may still get bent by the lens and create a bright spot on your image. Um, if you have water droplets or insects or things like that, and your camera has a flash, the flash will illuminate whatever is close to the lens. It'll be out of focus, but it'll make a bright sphere that'll show up on the image. So it's very easy to get fake uh, orbs that look quite real. Um, so that's one thing to be careful about. Uh, if you're present when it happens, uh, a stereo camera works really well at eliminating um, this problem. When I went out in the uh, field with some of my friends looking for orbs years ago, in that state park case that I mentioned to you, one of the things we did, we, I had a remote uh, strobe, a strobe light operating with a battery, and it would just you could put it up next to a grave, a grave site and have it flash and then take pictures. And the camera that we use, or, or our eyes, would be far away from the flash. So you had none of, the, none of this problem of a camera with its own flash. The two things were separate. So um, we would see oftentimes when this flash would occur, we'd see an orb several inches in diameter. It would be, be visible just for that short instant that the flash happened. And in those cases, there's no chance for a fake orb. Those were genuine orbs. There's no other way to explain them. So it's a separate illumination source is really important. This little picture here kind of summarizes some of the ways of getting fake orbs. And I mentioned lens flare, I mentioned uh, near field dust and insects and things like that. Um, you could also get multiple exposures or the camera could be moving, other things that might cause paranormal looking effects by accident. Um, I think we're in the age now with the shift that is starting to happen that um, learning to go out of body is more and more important. Um, it's probably the skill that all of us need to be learning. I'm probably one of the really the slow kids in the class uh, even though I've gone to Monroe a couple different times, uh, I can't say that I'm that I do it or know how to do it or I'm very good at it. Uh, you have to first of all turn your left brain off, stop all that rational thinking. Um, and that's kind of hard for me. But um, places like Monroe, Hemisync technologies, other electronic technologies that help us to to loosen up our our astral body so we can go out of body uh, is probably really a good thing to be learning. I think it helps with intuition. When I took remote viewing uh, classes years ago, I discovered that um, you often do end up out of body when you are in a very profound remote viewing state. If you're remote viewing the target and you get more and more absorbed in the target, you lose track of sort of normal space and time. And in some cases, I found myself essentially out of body. and I was more at the target than I was in my physical body. Uh, this is a, a picture of a Monroe Institute at a distance. It's a lovely place in the hills of Virginia, a very rural area. Um, it's just one of many places that you can go for training or study. They have also tapes, home study, and things like that. Um, Bob Monroe 
is one of our sources of knowledge about the outer body because he did so much exploration and um, his students have also done a lot. So he says that exploration out of body is a prime means of functioning outside the physical universe. That's one of the, the viewpoints I've come across from my, my research in writing this book that the physical body is just is not the primary important part of our identity. This is just our body suit that we're wearing to have a physical experience in this lifetime. The part of us that's really permanent and eternal is our soul, our soul body, these energies that, that can really travel across space and time uh, so easily, go out of body so easily. That's really the essence of who we are. And that's what it would put Bob Monroe found as well that when you begin traveling out of the body, there's so much more to explore, and so much more to find. Uh, and one thing he found is that you can visit the afterlife. That's one of the uh, things that both he and his students discovered. Um, Bruce Moen uh, has written five or six books about traveling into the afterlife and doing research into it, and he finds the structure and the events are very similar to what other afterlife researchers using totally different methods are also finding. And because orbs are much smaller than the physical body, and yet they contain all the information we need to replicate it. If they have all our consciousness, they have a copy of the physical body in terms of template or the double. Uh, and that implies, because we know that it's small, maybe a centimeter or two in diameter, that implies that much higher frequencies are involved than we're used to in the physical. Physicists and scientists tend to think about our physical reality and, and atoms, atoms are the building blocks. And atoms are 10 to the minus 10 meters, about an angstrom or so across, that kind of their size. And that's kind of the scale that we normally think of as being important for physical matter. But when you start looking at the afterlife, you begin to realize that there are more high frequencies. And our, our science has, by and large, neglected these high frequencies. Uh, we have a fundamental limit, according to our present beliefs of what's called the Planck length, which is about 20 orders of magnitude. It's 20 powers of 10, smaller than the size of the atom or the nucleus even. Um, and so there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of real estate, a lot of, a lot of dimensions, potential there for other forces, and other phenomena to be going on that we presently can't look at, we don't have theories for, we just kind of ignore them and assume they're not important. But it looks like they're probably really the most important parts of the afterlife. When mediums talk to spirits, or when we communicate with advanced spirits from many different forms, they tell us that the fine energies, that is the high frequencies, the short wavelengths, that's where the higher dimensions are. That's where the more advanced spirits are found. They talk about the higher frequencies. Well, that's what these small scales would imply. So the orbs are kind of leading us back to going into uh, what else, what, what are we missing right now? Where are the clues to a deeper understanding of the afterlife? And it looks like it's the higher frequencies, the very short wavelengths. Um, and um, I mentioned, that, so, so we, had, we ended up with a picture, like this picture here. This is kind of schematic, but this is just a, a length, a distance, a frequency scale, and a length scale. You know, the left is the longest wavelengths, uh, the size of the universe, 10 to the 26 meters. That's the biggest 
length we ever worry about. And then you start going toward the middle of this, this is an exponential scale by powers of 10. In the middle of this graph is something on the, roughly on the order of the human scale. Um, molecules, angstroms, quarks. Then on the right hand, you get smaller and smaller and smaller, which means higher and higher frequency. So it's the smallest length, the Planck length, the highest possible frequency. And that would be the limit. And so by this graph, you can see that everything on the right hand side of this graph is basically out of reach of our present physics. And it's unstudied. But that appears to be where these wavelengths are found that make up the uh, make up the soul body, make up the, uh, the astral body, and, and all the higher planes that, take a, that, that are involved in higher consciousness and involved with the afterlife. So I have here the astral, and I think it goes probably hierarchically, so that astral is the, is the first one. Astral will be the lowest frequency of these afterlife planes. Then the higher frequencies that you go up would be the, the mental plane, then above that would be the causal, then the buddhic, and these are the higher and higher planes. Um, and so I'm starting to make a model to understand how we can begin to think about matter and the science of the afterlife. I mean, Yogananda talks about matter in these higher planes. He says, just like we have atoms, that make up our physical matter. We have building blocks that make up objects in the astral plane, the mental plane, etc. He calls them life trons. Consciousness plays a bigger role in these frequencies. They're non-material in the way we think about it, but there is a logic to it. There's a science to it. And there's a structure to it. So. Um, my book is just really an attempt to try to go as far as I can to understand what we know and how, to, how maybe the structure can be put together. One interesting fact is that torsion that I have talked about in my last book and in this book is overlooked in Western physics. Torsion is a force. It's kind of like electromagnetism. It's, it's involving a twist in space time. It becomes more and more powerful at smaller and smaller scales. Uh, the Russian work shows it is the essence of psychic phenomena. It's the essence of ESP. It's the essence of remote viewing. So um, to me, the torsion and the smaller scales are kind of leading us toward a new physics that might be able to help us understand what the afterlife is really like. And this is what I just said pretty much here, that the soul is made of very high frequencies and therefore can, can contain much more information than things we're normally used to. I mean, if you think about a soul, it may contain all of the information, all of our histories, all of our past lives, all the people that we've known, um, the, the blueprints of these uh, bodies, these, these templates of all these different forms we have to be able to manifest into, it may contain a lot of information. And so smaller frequencies, smaller wavelengths, higher frequencies make that possible. So this suggests that the frontier of physics in which consciousness will be most important will also involve the very small scales that present in science tends to ignore. We already know there's an enormous amount of energy and information potentially in these fine realms. So Bob Monroe was right. We're more than our physical bodies. Through prayer, meditation, visualization, we can create the world we want. And as Victor Hugo said, all of the armies of the world are not as powerful as an idea whose time has come.
My website is synchronizeduniverse.com. I invite you to go there if you haven't visited there. I'm trying to put more information there. It's not really fully functioning yet. I've got quite a bit up there. I, I don't have a storefront thing yet. If anybody wants to purchase my book, the best way is to write me at Claude Swanson at Gmail or just go to my website and you'll see that there and write me directly if you want to purchase the book. Um, but anyway, that's, that's under construction now, but uh, that's where we are. So I guess we're ready now for, um, for questions and comments and conversation. Yes, we have one question here. Okay. I'm Arlene Graham. How do people communicate in their energy body? Can they speak or is it telepathic? Um, I, I think it's both. Well, I think it's both. It's a good question. I, I think both things happen. I think it is. I think the telepathic. I mean, I'll, I'll, the telepathic to me is a interaction of our energy fields with theirs, which that would be what I would describe as telepathy. Um, as I mentioned, these orbs. If you're in the orb form you are able to generate more of a physical signal as well. But I think most mediums, when they are working, would normally uh, be working telepathically. In fact, we have a lot of examples uh, in my book of, of cases where a medium is working with a spirit and um, the spirit talks about talks about the communication process. Uh, so, so I think most of us are telepathic. That's, that's probably the easiest way. I mean, we, there are certain, in, in my book, there are certainly cases where spirits are able to generate physical sounds, but it, it, I think well, there's, there's two there's two issues. Uh, George uh, George Meek did research for many years on electronic voice phenomena. He wanted to uh, develop electronic devices to be able to pick up uh, communication with uh, spirits. And um, what he found is that the ones that, that, the, that the easiest methods, they're the ones uh, such as Raudeva was using or, um, or Jurgensen were using with uh, tape recorders, that what you normally get the lower, lower level spirits when doing that. So these are spirits that are still kind of closely attached to the astral plane. They can get back to the earth plane fairly easily so their frequencies are lower and they can communicate more easily with us, but they might not be the communications we, we would most like to have. Uh, Meek wanted to speak with the higher, more evolved spirits that were in the higher planes. And it seems like that as they graduate to the higher planes, you lose more of that contact with the physical. So it's harder to generate what we would call conventional physical vibrations. Um, so the telepathic is easier at the higher levels. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions. Well, one more here um, from Scott Silverman. What is the relationship between the etheric body in our human aura, is etheric body always protected when it is out of body? Well, it's a good question. I, I don't think I'm smart enough to answer that. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to know too. I think I think that uh, I. I, I it's a, it's a very good question. I don't think I know the answer. Um, no. I, I, it's one thing I worry about because what we see when, when you go out of body, 
the voltages at the physical body are reduced. Um, and so normal physical functioning is lower. So I think, I think the real key there is to be pretty confident that I think your higher self will tell you, you'll get a warning to get back, to come back if there's some need for it, most likely. So I would think that would be probably the answer. Uh, I, I could tell you that the spiritist research has shown that um, that no matter how far away you are, you know, it, your astral body is in an, in an out-of-body experience, mm -hmm. no matter how far away you are from your physical body, the instant the physical body needs the spirit back, it's back. Okay. That there is no danger of getting stuck out there and not being able to come back or anything like that that people worry about. Uh -huh. that, that's not a problem. Yeah, well, well, good. And see, this is, <laughs> this is probably the kind of worry I would have, too. See, I would worry about that stuff, too. Mm. Good. Okay, thank you, Gloria. Um, let's see. I think that's all the questions I see right now. I, I, I'm like, I have a Q&A folder here. Oh, that, here's uh, something. Here's another one. Red number four. Yeah, four yeah that's, what, that's where I'm reading the questions. You can, can I click on that? Yeah, and there is another question here. Oh, here we go. Okay. From Cynthia Aubrey. Hi, Cynthia. So, during a medium or spirit sitter conversation, it's difficult to register or record the energy involved with the communication with the instruments due to the spirit's higher, higher vibration, though the medium can see, hear, sense them right. Um, is there any more? I, I think it's what, it's what she's saying there is that these high frequencies, we don't have ways of measuring them with our instrumentation. Is that what she's? Yes, that is kind of what she's saying. Yeah, and, and I, I, would, I would agree with that, that I think you know, right, right now, the only ways we have of measuring are things like EVP and things like that, where it's kind of, or, or direct voice, where with, with ectoplasm, the spirit is using to make a sound. So we, the spirit has to do most of the work. They have to come more than halfway to make these things. Uh, and our, our technology is not far enough along to, um, you know, to be able to know how to do that. I mean, we are obviously developing devices with higher and higher frequency, but you know, there are a lot of conversations that George Meek had with his uh, spirits when he was interacting with them. Uh, George Meek is, I have a lot of uh, information about him in my book. Uh, he was an engineer who was trying to develop a device that could speak directly to spirits. And he uh, made contact with a couple of different uh, retired physicists who came back. One, you know, one was quite pretty well known who came back and was giving him very explicit guidance, uh, you know, from the spirit world, will tell him to change certain values of resistors and things like that, you know, to help him uh, help his device work better. Um, but they all, they all, you know, they all were were pretty clear that the higher that as you go to higher frequencies, it's more difficult. And I I also think that there's probably some reluctance on the spirit side to make it, make it too easy for us. <laughs> because um, this particular scientist mentioned that there have been cases where some force or some group had tried to kind of bust into the spirit world from our side with technology. And um, I think they have a lot of technology over there. I mean, that's the one thing that I found most interesting is that in the astral plane and the uh, and the higher plane, they have laboratories, and they can work full time. In fact, mm -hmm. George, I mean, George uh, Bob Monroe talks about his to his colleagues. He's been very happy since he died because he has a very well equipped lab on the other side, and he says that 
Not, everything's free over there. You can just kind of imagine it and manufacture it just like that. Uh, so they have a lot of knowledge, There's a lot of knowledge of these, these higher sciences, but they can't give it to us. They can't give it to us until we're ready for it. So that, that's where I think that our own consciousness shift and our own evolution is so important that as, as, we, as we go up higher in our evolution, we'll be able to receive a lot more. There's so much available that we're not ready for yet. Because we'll be purifying our intentions. Yeah, exactly. Tension we'll, has a lot to do with it. Yeah, we won't misuse it, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Uh, let's see, I don't know if there's any more. Don't see anything more. I, mine is staying at number five here now, so I... Somebody. Yeah, yeah, I've read them all, though. Uh, okay. I mean, there. I didn't read the thank yous, but... Okay. Um, yeah, I had a question as you were talking, and now I forgot it. Okay. Oh, did, uh, did I miss... I might have missed it um, if, if I got distracted... Did you talk about the silver cord? I didn't. I'm well, very, very briefly. I mentioned like enduring sleep. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, of course, as as you, as you know, I mean, when when it breaks, then we that's our that's our signal. We're not coming back. Then our physical body yeah. will die at that point. Yeah. Um, there are, you know, some researchers talk about the energies that are involved that pass up and down the silver cord. Uh, and, and I think uh, my own personal theory is that w one of the characteristics of life is that we tend to defy uh, entropy. We, we defy the basic rules of thermodynamics, that we are more efficient than we should be if we were just normal uh, machines. And um, torsion is keys to how we do and I suspect the silver cord is where some of this energy is passing back and forth during sleep that enables us to replenish. But I didn't. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't that. That's also one of the reasons why we're safe when we're out of body, because mm -hmm. we're connected. We're still connected. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So there's one more question here. Mm -hmm. From Scott Silverman okay. to elucidate. Oh, wait, there's two more. One, Cynthia Aubrey, are you going to have a session about techniques to learn how to go into out of body experiences? Um, I, I hadn't planned to because I, I would not class myself as an expert on that. I'd be happy to give you reference, references. And we can right. do sessions together, but it's not something that is my forte. Um, so I guess that would be the answer. That I mean, I did teach one course, one lecture, as you may remember, at Caritas on how to see the aura, and I don't class myself as an expert <laughs> on that either. But I did actually do the lecture. But so anyway, that's something I probably maybe I should aspire to doing, doing this lecture so that I'll have mm -hmm. to get better at it myself. But uh, I've been trying to get Gabe Sereni to do something. He oh. is that. He teaches out of body experience. Wow. And That's he's very accomplished at okay. it. Okay. Well. But okay. so far, you know, he's busy with the baby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Scott Silverman says, could you elucidate the relationship between Qi and Russian torsion field research. I believe you discussed this in the new book. If you mentioned this and I missed it, my apologies. Okay, well, thank you. I, that's something I can, I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> my, my second book, Life, Life Force, uh, is devoted heavily to this subject. Uh, so that's really the, the principal area where I would... So in this book here, I'm kind of using some of the results from that, and I'm referring to them. Um, but in in that book, um, 
I talked about the, the different types of research Western scientists have done with chi and with torsion. Um, basically, it seems to be essentially the same thing to me, that um, there are two polarities of chi, right and left, and there's two polarities of torsion, right and left. And um, from a physics point of view, which is how the Russians have been analyzing it, you can think about torsion as being a twisting of space-time, um, which is something that Einstein kind of overlooked when he did his theory. Um, and um, it becomes really important because all of, the, all of the physical particles in our universe, like the proton, the electron, the neutron, they all have, they all have a spin. So they all spin just like little tops. And that means they have, a, they have a special direction that they're pointing. And that means that torsion will affect them very strongly. And whenever they shift direction, they make torsion. So it looks like in our, in our, in our universe, torsion is a very important force. It's being exchanged all the time. It's flying through space all the time. Now, it looks like the human body has evolved to take advantage of this, um, even though our scientists don't know about it. But you know, our, our smart evolutionary body learns that some things work better. And if, if you have a, an advantage, then that particular trait will get enhanced and through evolution. And so that there are certain molecules that are left-handed and right-handed. They, they look just the same, but one is a mirror image of the other. And we find that like a sugar, for example, that's left-handed has totally different action than a sugar that's right-handed. So this whole idea of twist on the chemical level and also within, within the body on the anatomical level, our organs are not symmetric. We may on the outside look symmetric, but our, our whole alimentary canal, our, our, our liver, our stomach, they're all arranged in kind of a spiral pattern to take advantage of torsion again. So it kind of shows up um, it, in our acupuncture meridian system in the body, uh, which carries something that our Western science doesn't really understand what it carries. Okay, and so we kind of ignore it. But the Chinese, of course, that's been the basis of their science for 5,000 years. So there must be something to it. And it, it looks like one, one of the things it carries is this torsion energy, which sort of flows through the body um, it, because it's present in space all the time. And then our body can kind of filter it to take advantage of take which part, which, which polarity, which spin it needs. Um, it looks like the, like the right-hand spin is probably better for, for building up things, for building up uh, protein, for metabolism, things like that. So our body needs these spins. And the acupuncture meridian system is good for carrying that special energy. You can filter it. You, you, you collect a certain polarity of it. And then you can move it down the meridian. So, for example, when a Qigong master talks about how he exerts qigong, uh, this, this stuff responds to the mind, first of all, both for torsion and qi. It has the same properties that our consciousness is able to control it. By thinking, by visualizing, it will respond to our consciousness because our consciousness, again, is a torsion field. It's the aura, okay? So it interacts directly with the torsion field. So a qigong master will gather up a pool, a pool of a certain kind of chi energy that he wants to use, and then shoot it down some meridian and out some acupuncture point out of his palm of his hand or something like that, and, and, and make a ray of this stuff to exert a force at some distance or exert some healing, etc. So so it looks like the torsion and the the chi are kind of like they're 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 all basically the same thing. From my point of view, and and, um, and also the um, Wilhelm Reich's work with orgone, or, or, or and, uh, and and Baron von Reichenbach's work with ode, 
in the 19th century or 18th century, again, they were looking at the same energy. And just each one had a slightly different point of view, a nomenclature, but I think it's all the same stuff. I think, oh. Did I put you to sleep? <laughs> so, no, no. Um, I'm looking and Scott has another question. So spiral nebulas express torsion on a galactic level? It, it's possible. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about that. And, and I'm not really saying that. What, what torsion, torsion, torsion is produced whenever something that is spinning changes its spin direction. So it's usually the it's change of angular momentum that would generate the torsion, mm -hmm. my understanding. Um, but I think torsion shows up in lots of different ways. Um, for example, dark matter, the supposedly mysterious stuff that no astronomer in the West can understand. Um, the Russians, it, 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 they talk about uh, the characteristics of torsion going mm -hmm. back to the 1950s. And the left-handed torsion uh, behaves exactly like dark matter. And the right-handed torsion behaves exactly like dark energy. And so it looks like it's the same stuff. It's just that our scientists, again, have you know, kind of refused to acknowledge that it's out there. So it, it does look so, so dark matter or torsion is kind of around all the galaxies for that reason. We, we would say it's dark dark matter, but it's more accurate probably to say it's, it's torsion energy. Um, I don't see any more, right? Oh wait, no, there is more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cynthia Aubrey, does this or how does this torsion energy interact or possibly activate our light body DNA, Merkaba? Uh, hmm. I, I don't know is probably the answer. I don't know. Um, I, think that, I, I think that... Does torsion follow thought? It, it does. It does. And, so, and certain kind of medita when you do meditation, for example, when you are visualizing bringing energy up the spine, for example, mm -hmm. um, it's, you can think of it, I think of it as the torsion energy that mm -hmm. you're bringing up the spine and you're collecting it, concentrating it in certain organs. So in my own personal opinion, uh, when we activate the pineal gland, for example, we're kind of charging it up with a certain kind of torsion and that causes it to function. Um, and, and I think it's really acting as a lens of torsion. It's acting as a lens that's allowing us to make four dimensional images. So we're, but it probably has to be activated first with torsion to do it. So, um, you know, I, I think it's again, it's a charging up of the whole system with the torsion to make things function the way they're supposed to. Yeah, well, if torsion follows thought, then, you know, thought can change our DNA. I mean, Bruce Lipton's work shows that, uh, right. the biology of belief. Uh, so I would imagine that, you know, in some way it would interact with or, or activate or affect anyway. Yeah, that makes, that makes total sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And, and as I showed in, in volume two, our, our aura, our aura is really made of torsion. Right. And our aura really is carrying the pattern for our entire body. So it's, it's, it's the biophotons are interacting closely with the DNA. So we have this linkage between torsion and DNA through the biophotons. It's pretty direct. So that all kind of makes sense from that way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. All right. I don't see another question now. Let me see. Wait. Uh, no. Uh, okay. Well, um, I want to thank you, Claude, for another very informative and compelling lecture. Um, and to let people know that uh, 
the next, your next lecture, which is part five, uh, is on mediums. Yes. And chapter four. In the I'm book. sorry? It's on chapter four in the book. Exactly. And, and the day we picked for that is? September 25th. Also a Wednesday, seven o'clock, September 25th. Very good. Yeah. So, um, uh, I'll see you, everyone there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And I'm going to end the meeting now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.